Hello all our beautiful blessed people. It's such a privilege to be with you here again today. Yes, for sure. Welcome, welcome. Good morning. Goeie dag. Good evening. Good afternoon. Whatever time we're looking at it this day. Yes. So we are finishing our fast. We had a wonderful time of prayer and fasting. Um, and as I was praying this week, uh, the Lord gave me a word for our people, for our congregation. And I quickly want to share it with you. You know, for some of us, the year didn't start as we've hoped, as we've planned. Some of our people experienced loss and sadness and pain. And as I was praying into that, the Lord just gave me this word. He said, hope and keep on. Just keep on keeping on. And he gave me this well-known verse. And I'm going to share it with you because God's word is always new. Hmm. It's Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. So I pray for all of our people. Amen. Peace and hope for this year for the year that's still ahead and you know it's just that the way the year started is not the tone for mm. the year that's still ahead mm. the best is yet to come Amen. he's got good plans for us Amen. he's got hope for us for this yes, year hallelujah. so get up and stand fast on that hope mm. on that peace and that's what we pray for you for Amen. our beautiful blessed people Amen. Yes, amen. Yeah, we're finishing with a fast today and I have to say that physically this fast has been one of the easier ones that I've had to endure. But spiritually this is probably the toughest fast that I've ever engaged in. I've never been in this kind of spiritual battle that I was in. Not just over the virus but for our people that I've been in in in, in, in this fast but it's an amazing privilege because I know from it there's going to come great and marvelous Amen. testimonies of yes. God's goodness and glory mm. so we're excited mm. and we're excited about this year it's a year filled with hope yes Amen. yeah so father we just thank you for your goodness we thank you for your kindness we thank you lord that you are a god of hope yes. we thank you lord that you are a god as as Celeste shared with us now lord God that knows the thoughts. Lord, that even if we think 2021 is not going to be what it is, you've got a different thought about it. And it's a thought of prosperity. It's a thought of hope. It's a thought of God is not finished with us yet. It's a thought that we can rely on. It's a thought we can have peace in and we thank you for that peace lord we thank you for your goodness and lord as we receive the word today let it be a word that's rooted in our hearts lord our hearts accept it to it lord let it fall upon us lord and wash us afresh and anew for your goodness and your glory in jesus mighty name amen amen hallelujah hallelujah well i'm still engaged in the four altars of the heart and then uh, i've been so blessed by what the lord has shared to me um, shared with me about the four altars that abraham which is oftentimes referred to as the father of our faith that he was engaged in you know he built four altars and um the four altars that he built symbolizes things and that's how i made the conclusion that the four altars um, of Abraham are like the four chambers of our heart. They form part of a whole. Uh, it's very hard to actually separate them. And we cannot live without one chamber in our hearts. And I want to tell you that we cannot live without these principles, um, which I refer to as altars. Now, I've spoken a lot about altars and what they are in the previous two 
So if you've missed that, um, just go and listen to the few minute, the, the 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 beginning, the introduction minutes of 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 the previous two sermons where we talk about what what altars are, what their purpose are, what the concept behind them and the idea behind them was, etc. So I'm not going to stand there today, but I'm going to move to the third altar that Abraham built and what it represented, and how. It is something that should be established within our hearts. Hallelujah. So if you've got your Bible, you can just open it up to the book of Genesis. First book of the Bible. And then from Genesis, just page 2, chapter 13. Last week we were in chapter 12. This week we're moving to chapter 13. Now, if we are, last week in chapter 12, we spoke about the altar that Abraham built between Bethel and Ai. Bethel, which represents the house of God, which is the place of open heavens, because that is where Jacob lied on the rock and the heavens opened and he dreamt how there was a staircase between heaven and himself. And our angels moved up and down and he heard the voice of God coming from the top of it. And I being a place of destruction, which is the first place um, that... Um, the Israelites experienced defeat uh, when they entered into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. So it's a place of destruction. It's a place of disappointment. It's a place of hurt. And now Abram went and in between these two places built an altar, which basically signifies that we should pray despite our circumstances. When we pray, it should be despite the fact whether we're experiencing circumstances of destruction, circumstances of pain, of, 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 of um, uh, um, you know, uh, circumstances that didn't go our way, things that we didn't plan it, um, certain disappointments that we've experienced. But it should also form part of our lives when... We're experiencing open heavens. Oftentimes people will pray when they experience open heavens. Oftentimes people will only pray when they experience the brokenness, the, the ruins, the, the pain and the disappointments. But what God wants us to do is, is He wants us to separate prayer from these circumstances so that we pray Despite the circumstances that we pray, whether we're in trouble times, whether we're experiencing hurt and pain and, resent and, and disappointment and all of that, uh, and whether we are experiencing open heavens, experiencing in the house of the Lord. Some people really only pray when they're in church. Um, despite all of that, he wants to establish it because he built the altar between these two places. We spoke about how Prayer infuses us with power as it connects us to the supernatural. We spoke about how prayer is not a grocery list, but it is a place of communion, a place where God wants to commune with us, um, a place where even in our communion, the plan, the, the, the reason for prayer was not so that we can go to God with our petitions, but that we can speak to Him, that we can commune with Him, that we can have communion with Him. And from our communion, we are then able to make our prayers, our requests, our desires known to God. We spoke about how Jesus in His greatest time of need um, didn't ask for money, didn't ask for an army, didn't ask for his disciples to hide him and cover for him. He didn't ask for his people to, you know, organize something for him to keep him safe. He asked them to pray. And that is very significant because in God's most, in God, in Jesus Christ's most, his greatest hour of need, his greatest hour he said to his disciples, please pray with me. So the greatest gift you can give to anyone is prayer. But I'm talking about real prayer. I'm not talking about good thoughts or good meanings. I'm talking about prayer. I'm talking about altar kind of prayer. Nothing happens without prayer. We spoke about that. Nothing, nothing, nothing happens without prayer. And obedience is prayer and prayer is obedience. 
Um, and um, yes, prayer is just the connection to the supernatural. If you have a person who prays, if you have a person who's got an altar of prayer, you've got a person who's connected to the supernatural. That's just how it is. They connect it. Because you say, ah, oh, pastor, the supernatural thing. Yes, we are praying to a supernatural God. So the moment we pray, we connect it to the supernatural. And uh, yes, so today we are at the third altar. And that is um, written up in Genesis 13. We'll start off at verse 1. We'll read the first four verses. We'll jump to verse 14 and read the last four verses there. Right, so verse 1 of chapter 13. Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had. He took everything with him, and Lot with him, to the south. Abram was rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and I, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called upon, called on the name of the Lord. So here we see Abram returning to the altar of prayer. This is so amazing because it now becomes significant. Prayer is significant. Abram returns to this specific place after he came from Egypt. He comes there and years after that he comes to this place and he again, the first thing he does is to pray. So he enters this land that God has given him and he prays. This land God has promised to him and he prays about it. So he calls upon the name of the Lord. And what is so significant is, is I believe that the Bible is the most purposeful book that there is. Nothing in this book is there just because it's there. There's a purpose behind it. God wants us to see something in it. God wants us to understand something with it. So when we read that he came back to this place, and he prayed. If you actually look at these first four verses in context with the chapter, it almost seems as if, what has this got to do with anything? If you read the rest, it goes about Lot and about what happens between Abraham and Lot. And these first four just says, they came back from there, he came to that place and he called upon the name of the Lord. And then from verse 5, it goes about what it's headlined in the chapter. So, this is just amazing. He comes to this place and he prays. Nothing happens without purpose. God is the most purposeful being alive. And the Bible is one of the most purposeful books there is. I want to say the most purposeful book there is. Because prayer prepares you for what is to come. Abraham was calling upon the name of the Lord. That is why I believe it is there. He called upon the name of the Lord, and I believe that the Lord prepared him for what is about to come. He received something in prayer there that was going to equip him for something to come. You say, ah, oh, pastor, that might be a little bit far-fetched because it's not literally written like that in the Bible. Well, let me put it to you this way. When every day starts, what do we do? We pray. We pray and say, Lord, I submit this day unto you. Please make my paths straight. What do we do then? What are we doing? We are praying in the beginning of the day that the Lord will prepare us for what is going to happen in this day. Lord, give me wisdom for this day. Prayer prepares me for what is to come. That's why it's so important to pray. With prayer comes increase. Because as we commune with God, He prepares us, changes us. We spoke about this last week. Changes us to be able to receive what we need. Let's just look at what we've just said. When I pray, Lord, make my paths straight for today. 
what is he doing? He's bringing increase in me so that I can handle what is going to happen in the rest of this day. If I pray, Lord, give me wisdom for this day. I am praying increase in wisdom so that when I am confronted with a situation that's going to need my attention, I will have the wisdom to encounter it. So prayer brings increase. That prayer has brought forth the change that was needed in me to endure and to deal and to overcome and to be victorious in the day that I'm about to face. So prayer brings increase. And the Bible says it also brought increase in Abram because it changed Abram. That verse 2 says, Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. Any person who functions, any Christian who functions in a prosperous lifestyle should be a person who prays a lot. Because that is the difference between us being controlled by what we have and by being controlled by God. A person who prays is able, well, what did Ravi Zechariah say? Let's just um, repeat that. Let me just go back to that. Um, if you are a praying Christian, your faith will carry you. If you are not a praying Christian, you will have to carry your faith and you will get exhausted trying to carry the infinite. So here we see that prayer brings forth increase and it changed our Abraham, it bring, brought forth an increase with him that God could bless him because he knew that the blessings would not consume Abraham, but that Abraham would be able to rule and reign over his blessing. He would call upon the name of the Lord, not his possessions, which is very important. We oftentimes rely on our bank accounts to save us in difficult situations instead of relying on God. Abram had his first reliance on God. And because of that, God increased his bank account. And that just made, and let us be honest, life easier. But his main reliance was on God. Prayer strengthen. Oh, as I already said, um, be wise in what you pray for. You might just get it. So we've got to be wise in what we pray because nothing happens without prayer and we might just get it. Oftentimes I say, Lord, I pray for great wealth. Well, then you have to know that God who answers prayer is going to bring forth a change within you so that you can deal with what you've just received. Now, we are so excited when we receive the blessing. But then we feel as if all hell's broken loose when God is preparing me to deal with that blessing. And oftentimes that's why I say be wise in what you pray for because you might just get it. And you might just get it because of the things that God wants to do within you before you receive what you've prayed for. Because He's not in the business of destruction. But that's just things that we've just seen here. From verse 13 in these first four verses about prayer. Right now, let's jump to verse 14. And the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your, you, uh, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then the descendants also, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the light, well, ach, in the land, through its le length and its width, width, and I, for I give it to you. Then Abraham moved from his tent. And went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, and which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. 
Right, so what happened here is, is that there was a fight between Abram's uh, 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 um, herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen. They were so blessed by God that the increase happened so greatly that eventually they started to fight about water, about land, about graze, about whose is whose. This is Lot's sheep, that's Abram's sheep. And I can just imagine, you know, when, 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 when it's time to... Uh, for for the for, for, for the livestock you know to 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 to, to uh, multiply then it would be an argument but that's my master's my, my master's female goat and that's my master's female oh, male ram you know the ram and stuff and then it'll be this fight so i can just imagine where all of this came from and then Abram said, we are brothers. He spoke to Lot. Listen, we are brothers. Let's, let's, let, let's, let's keep this civilized. You choose the land you want and I'll go. If you go east, I'll go west. If you go west, I'll go east. If you go north, I'll go south, south, east, north. That's what I will do. And I've oftentimes seen people do this, but to their detriment. And I wonder to myself, this is such a peaceful act, but where is God in it? Well, the answer is in verse 4. There Abram called upon the name of the Lord. Prayer prepares you for what is to come. A lot of people do these things. They say, oh, well, I'm not in it for a fight, you know. They must have it, but it's to their detriment. When Abram said to Lot, choose a piece of land, it was not to his detriment. It was to Lot's detriment, but not to his detriment. So when he said that, he did it from a position of prayer. Oftentimes people do that to keep the peace. And let me tell you, it's a selfish act. And you say, Pastor, how can that be a selfish act? When he said to Lot, whatever piece of land, if he didn't come with prayer, whatever you choose and I'll go the other way. Let me tell you why it's selfish. Because you the person did it to avoid confrontation. And that's selfish. Because he's doing it for his own self. He's not doing it because he's guided. He's not doing it because he's led. And he's not doing it from a position of prayer. Because if he did it from a position of prayer, he would have been prosperous. Many people disconnect themselves from places, churches, people, not out of prayer, but out of a lack of confrontation. And it removes them from the blessing. Lot was removed from the blessing. You can read that in verse 14. But Abraham remained connected to the blessing because he made his decisions from a position of prayer. That is very, very, very important. So, right. <clears throat> One of the greatest imposers, and I would almost like to say, yeah, let's use the word imposers. One of the greatest imposers of prayer, oh, one of the, uh, let's, sorry, sorry, sorry. That brings me to the third altar. The third altar is an altar, my opinion, third altar is an altar of peace. Abram was at peace when he gave Lot the piece of land. He was at peace. God actually confirmed to him and affirmed to him that this is his land. So, you know, all that he did was is he was allowing Lot to be in a part of piece of land that was actually his. Because God promised it to him and his descendants forever. So, Abram was in a position of peace. He gave Lot the better part, because Lot chose the better part, the way the rivers is, and the valley, the green grass, there's water, there's abundance, there's prosperity, there's, the ground is fertile, all of that, it's the best piece. But he chose the other side, and he had peace. So this third altar was like an altar of Peace. We don't see him calling upon the name of the Lord. He just built an altar there to the Lord. So I believe that the third altar is the altar of peace. If you look at your heart, praise, prayer, peace. Three Ps. Praise, prayer, peace. 
And um, one of the greatest imposers to our peace is not the big things, but the small things. The Bible says there was not a strife between Abram and Lot. Abram actually says, um, for we are brethren, we are brothers. But there was a fight between their herdsmen, which is a little bit further down the line if you look at authority position than the two of them. And it's oftentimes the small things, the herdsmen, the little things that come and affect our peace. And we realize that these small things have such a great impact on our peace that we actually become so overwhelmed by it that it starts to create a sense of disunity, a sense of strife, a sense of fighting over small things. You can look in marriages, husband and wife, children and parents, friends. Um, you can look at it in, in workplaces between co-workers, the boss and the workers small things and it accumulates it becomes more and more and it gets to a point where it starts to become strife now it's not just a fight it becomes a strife this is work this is draining this is where did it begin small things small things affect our peace so we need to guard our peace by guarding against the small things sort it out don't be ignorant. Don't be arrogant towards it. Sort it out. A lot of people run away from it. Abram did not run away from those problems. He prayed about it. A lot of people run away from those problems instead of confronting the small things. That's why I'm saying they, have, they did what Abram did, but not from a position of peace but from a position of avoiding confrontation so these small things affect us guard your heart against the small things peace Abram had peace because these small things were nitty gritty things to him and he realized he realized that the land was his anyway so it doesn't matter if lot's there for how long and however long lot's going to be there it's still his it's not going to become lots it's going to remain his because god says that i will give you this land for ever does he say that verse 14 verse 15 forever now i will for all the land which you see i give to you and your descendants forever from a position of peace bro you choose the place you want to go and you go i'll go the other way but it was from a position of prayer and from a position of peace peace by knowing what god's word was for his life and he received that in prayer awesome Praise, prayer, and peace connects us to the blessing of God. Praise, prayer, peace. Three altars. Praise, prayer, peace connects us to the blessing of God. Think, of, think on that a bit. Because if we don't have peace, we do not enjoy our blessings. You can be blessed. You can be so blessed. But if you don't have peace, you don't enjoy that blessing. Just think about if there's strife in the house, you right, between husband and wife, all right? You're going to have 10,000 Rand in your bank account to go and spoil yourself with. But because there's strife in your heart, there's strife in the marriage, there's this friction, you don't enjoy that blessing. You simply don't enjoy it as much as you would have enjoyed it. There was peace and you guys could have done it together. So Abram chooses the less desirable option. But he had peace because that is where God was. That's important. Oftentimes people grab something because it seems good, but it's not where God is. You've got to ask yourself this question honestly. Is God in what you are doing? Oftentimes people take the easier way out. Like Lot, 
I'll go live there in the valley that's fruitful. I'll go live there in the valley that's water. I'll go live there in the valley that's got the green grass. I'll go live there. It's more comfortable. But it's not what God has for you. Abram went the less desirable way. Because Lot chose the more desirable way. But God was not in the desirable. He was in that space. Because Abram was continue, continued to be blessed. Lot, you'll just find out in the next chapter, lost everything. Sometimes people are experiencing tough times. They're experiencing challenges. They're experiencing challenges not from the ministry that they're in, but in the things around it. Abram didn't experience trouble in his house, but they experienced troubles from the things around it. And it made life uncomfortable. So he had peace, but he also didn't just run away from the confrontation. He engaged in it. And he took the less desirable way because God was in it. We sometimes have to make decisions and choices. The first thing we need to ask ourselves is, is one of the first things we need to ask ourselves is, is God in it? Is God in it or am I making this on my own? Important question. The great thing in all of this is that whatever you do, have peace. The Bible says in Colossians 3 verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Philippians 4 verse 7, let the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Peace is a powerful, powerful factor. Now let's look quickly at verse 18. Well, let's look at where Abram built this altar and what these places represent. Let's first stand still at Mamre. Mamre refers to strength and fatness. Hebron refers to association. Now let's just stand still at Mamre. I hope I'm saying that correct in English. <clears throat> strength and fatness. Peace is not an outward feeling but an inward establishment. I'll say that again. Peace is not an outward feeling. It's an inward establishment. If my peace is associated to worldly things, then I am enticed by feelings. Feelings calm me down. I feel peaceful today. Tomorrow I might not. But if I have an inward establishment, despite the circumstances that I'm confronted with and are faced with, I have peace. Abram, despite the fact that he had to separate from this man, had peace because of an inward establishment which is done through the altar. The altar of peace inside our hearts. This must be prevalent. If you want to keep on growing and if you want especially to grow in spiritual maturity, peace is a very very big factor. The Holy Spirit works this within us. That is why it's so important to be spirit-filled. A spirit-filled child of God. Not just a, a spirit-filled child of God. Because the Bible refers to the fruit of the Spirit and one of the part of the fruit of the parts of the fruit of the Spirit is peace. So every spirit-filled child of God has got access to peace. It's within us. It's part of who we are. It's inseparable of who we are. We have it. What we should do is give more attention to it. We have that peace. We have that peace. Because true and lasting peace is only worked by the Holy Spirit. It is not worked by situations. It's not worked by circumstances. It's not worked by prosperity. It's not. It's worked by the Holy Spirit. Lasting and true peace is worked by the Holy Spirit. Peace is not a weakness. It's a strength. Oftentimes people will refer to peacemakers as, you know, we might not say it, but we think it. Oh, uh, you know, because they, they're not up for the fight. Peace is not a weakness. It's a strength. Because the absence of peace 
is draining. The absence of peace weakens a person. If a person hasn't got peace in his heart, you could see that person. They weigh down. They are tired. They are overcome. They are pressed down. They are continuously in a state of depression. They don't have peace. The peace is not a weakness. Peace is a strength. And peace is prosperity. People can have tons of money, but no peace. People can be poor, but no peace. They won't be fulfilled. People can have tons of money and have peace, and they'll be fulfilled. People will be poor and have peace and they'll be fulfilled. Peace is prosperity. Prosperity is peace. That's why the Jews use the word shalom to greet each other, which means peace. But it's not just peace. It's wholeness. It's prosperity. It's joy. It's all of that according to one word, shalom, which we refer to as peace. Because peace is prosperity. And true prosperity is peace. It's just how God works. Isn't he awesome? Isn't God awesome? Well, so Hebron is the place of association. What you associate yourself with determines with what you associate yourself with determines your peace. If you associate yourself with troublemakers, you're not going to have peace. If you associate yourself with people who oftentimes every now and then gets into some other fight because of a gossip, you're not going to have peace. If you associate your, yourself with people who are in the wrong all the time, you're not going to have peace because you're going to lie in bed and you're going to worry if you're going to be associated with them. You're going to worry if you're going to be pulled into their mess. What you associate yourself with determines your peace. But if we associate ourselves with the word, if we associate ourselves with in prayer, if we associate ourselves with the Holy Spirit, if we associate ourselves with the Holy Spirit, if we associate ourselves with the Holy Spirit, then peace abounds and we receive peace that's what happens now one of the greatest enemies of peace we talk about we spoke about the small things but one of the greatest enemies of peace is offense now let's use abram and lot if that had been the modern christian not in our church thank god but if that had been the modern christian it would have been like, oh, so now he takes the best part of the land. Oh, he got this and that and the other. Oh, and, 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 and I built a fence. Jesus speaks in the book of Matthew 10. Um, he speaks to his disciples and he says, if you go into a place, let your peace go. And if your peace returns to you, then dust the dust of your shoes and move on. Don't hold the grudge. Don't hold resentment. Don't be upset. Don't take offense. You see, if we take offense when we're in a situation because of disappointment, hurt, misunderstanding, um, whatever the case may be, even arrogance can cause offense. Not from the other person, from my side. Um, the fence of offense keeps my peace from returning to me. When Jesus said, if you, if you go into a place, then leave your peace. If the people receive the peace, you are at peace. If they don't receive the peace, that's when you have a problem. That's when you need your peace to return to you. If people don't receive you, that's when you need to have your peace returned to you. But if you've built or if you've taken offense, the fence keeps the peace from returning to you. Because you keep on pointing fingers in different directions. And peace cannot rule within your heart. You are consumed by the disappointment. We are consumed by the pain. We are consumed by the offense that I've taken. And it keeps my peace from returning to me. And you can see those people. 
They're the people that up, oftentimes goes up and down. Let's look at the altars quickly in order. We can pray, we can praise, we can pray. And if you look at the example that I've used with the blood and the heart, the deoxygenated blood comes in, it gets a praise on it. It gets a prayer on it, moves into the lungs, that gets the life force for the body. And oftentimes people praise and pray. But when it comes, which is awesome, and they receive that strength, and then fence of offense keeps it from, from the peace of ruling in their hearts. They've had awesome praise, um, a, a time in praise. They've had an awesome time in prayer. But they cannot be with, at peace with the people around them because of offense. The fence of offense keeps the peace from the heart. And Abram dealt with that. He said to Lot, you choose whatever and whatever you choose. We oftentimes say that. You choose whatever. But when they then choose what I actually wanted, when they choose what I would have liked, when they choose what I would have received as more, perceived as more comfortable and more nice and more blessed, then I built a fence. And it's like, oh, but this, that, and the other. And we all know what I'm talking about. And that fence keeps the peace from returning into our heart. And we then associate at Hebron with offense, which fences out the peace. Therefore, we cannot harbor or associate with offense. It is really one of the greatest enemies of peace. With an altar of peace, we are connected to strength and prosperity, which is well-being, and that associates us with the giver of peace. Who is the giver of peace? Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And that makes us a good association for other people to be surrounded with. Oftentimes, you'll have a person, if you're in his presence, you just experience peace and you walk away. You just experience this peace, this amazing, overflowing peace. It's because you've been associated with peace. Be peaceful so that those who associate with you can receive peace. Because we then become peace. It's part of our lives. Our life force is fueled by peace. Use the heart. It's been oxygenated in the, in, from prayer, oxygenated in the lungs. And the first thing it then needs is peace. Peace amplifies. Peace increases the life force. Peace connects us to the blessing of God. And peace comes from trusting in God. If we trust God, we know. I mean, Abram trusted God. He trusted God. He knew God had given him that peace. He knew who he was in God. He trusted God. People who take offense don't know who they are in God because they keep on looking for the acceptance of other people. And that's why they take offense when they don't get it. So, when we trust in God, we have peace. If I trust God in the midst of a storm, I'll have peace. If I trust God in the midst of my bestest, best moment, greatest joy, I'll have peace. Peace comes from trusting God. So your heart altar, the third altar, is an altar of peace. And God's blessing was upon Abraham. Even though he moved to a less desirable area. And he had peace. Peace. We are in one of the greatest challenges that we would have, that we have ever faced in our generation. We can have Peace. Peace. Because God has given us peace. So Father, I just thank you, Lord. I thank you for your peace. 
But your word says peace that surpasses all understanding. But that peace guards my heart from offense, guards my mind to be in line with my heart. And I thank you, Lord, because it keeps me in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for being the Prince of Peace. Holy Spirit, come and establish peace. Let the hearts of people be filled with peace. Remove any offense. I repent of any offense, Lord Jesus. And I say, Lord, fill me with your peace. I need your peace. My heart needs to be filled with your peace. As the third altar of my heart, a fixed, unmovable an establishment within my heart. Peace. Give us peace, Lord. And I thank you that we can trust in you. And as we trust in you, we have peace. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for your kindness and your loving mercies. Bless every person today. Lord, and as we proclaim the blessing, there is a power in it, Lord. Because I realize that in your countenance there is peace. We declare this blessing. Lord, no person can be in your countenance and not have peace. For then they are not connected. If they don't, they're not connected to the blessing. Because the blessing of the name of the Lord that's been placed upon us, Lord, which I'm about to speak about unto your people, declares this the lord bless you the lord keep you the lord have his face to shine upon you and be gracious towards you the lord have his countenance to rise over you and give you peace you are covered by the blood of the lamb and you are led by the holy spirit in jesus name amen we love you. We're really looking forward to seeing you all again soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. Bye-bye.